Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving up your time today to come along to our session to talk about all things uh, behaviour change and how to use uh, tech to improve uh, residents' uh, waste and recycling habits. Uh, so I'll just get everyone to introduce um, themselves quickly and then we'll go into presentations with questions and answers afterwards. Uh, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name's uh, Dominic Ridley-Moy um, and I run the Behaviour Change Network, um, work with organisations to develop behaviour change interventions uh, and campaigns, particularly around things like uh, recycling and fly tipping and also co-chair uh, the local public services group for the uh, Chartered Institute of uh, Public Relations. So I will uh, go to John Paul next, if you want to introduce yourself please. Hello, I'm John Paul. I'm from CAN. We help councils um, and other public sector organisations run uh, campaigns. Um, we do uh, lots of different sorts of media buying that specialise in programmatic and programmatic behaviour change go together so well. Um, and I'll be talking later on about how to apply programmatic to your campaigns. Hi everyone, my name is Phil Blythe. I work for a company called Web Aspects. And for our Recollect brand, we uh, help local authorities with digital recycling tools help improve their communication with residents. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tin and I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders at a company called Hello Lamppost. Uh, we also work with organisations like councils, uh, but also university campuses, shopping malls, property developers, um, physical environments outside of the home, um, so that they can better engage and communicate uh, and develop behaviour change with their audiences, um, or by making street infrastructure and objects interactive which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. Excellent. I'm very excited to hear uh, your presentations um, in a bit. So, uh, yeah, just to uh, go through how the, it's all going to work. Um, so um, I'm uh, going to kick off, just talk a bit about behaviour change theory and how you can use uh, that theory and apply it. Um, and then I'll hand over to the rest of the panel who are going to do a few short presentations uh, just about their work and how you can use uh, tech to achieve that behaviour change. And then we'll um, go into um, questions and answers afterwards. So the Q&A and the chat should both uh, be functioning okay. So do pop your questions in the chat and the Q&A as we go through um, and we'll pick them up um, after all the various uh, presentations. So I am just going to, if I can, I am going to share uh, my screen. Uh, share, okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, all good. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, so as I said, I work with um, organisations to run uh, behaviour change uh, campaigns and interventions. And I'm just going to talk a little bit um, about, um, about the types of uh, things you can do um, to run behaviour change campaigns. A little bit about uh, what is uh, behavioural economics, how we can use behavioural frameworks to help predict human behaviour, and how we can make use of uh, behaviour change theory, particularly to tackle uh, recycling, and also touch a little bit on, uh, on fly tipping as well. So a lot of the, a lot of the theories about bringing predictability to what appears to be unpredictable human behaviour. So a lot of it is about thinking about how can we bring uh, scientific uh, rigour to the process? How can we help people make better choices, do the right thing? And what behaviours do we want to change? So really thinking about what is it we want people to do differently? What influences their behaviour? Most importantly, how can we be confident that our interventions will be successful and how we can test uh, what it is that we've applied? So just uh, touching on that unpredictability. So this is a good example of what I mean by unpredictability. So on the left, uh, we've got a kind of rational model of thinking. We've got a can of lemonade. An irrational thinker might argue that to sell more, uh, you need to make it bigger, you need to make it taste better, you'd need to make it cheaper, all those kinds of things. Whereas on the right, you've got a can of Red Bull, which costs twice as much, it's half the size and to many doesn't taste uh, very nice. So that's a good example of how we can use psychology and counterintuitive marketing uh, to drive sales. So um, predicting what in essence could, uh, could be seen as uh, unpredictable. So when it comes to waste and recycling, it's really, really important to think about what affects decision making. 
So um, there's lots and lots of things that make a big, big difference. Um, and that's something that we all need to consider whether we work in comms roles or in operational roles is think about why are people behaving, what's driving them. So something like 80% of our, um, um, deci our decisions are driven by emotion. Beliefs are really important. What people think around us makes a big, big difference. Our socioeconomic status and then um, also cognitive biases, which I'll come back to. Uh, so for things for... Uh, like litter, um, recycling and waste, it's also really, really important to think about the context in which people are making decisions. So when people are doing things like deciding what to do with food waste or deciding whether to throw a uh, can in a recycling or not, um, the context is much more automatic. It's a much more fast thinking environment and the interventions are much, uh, much different compared to something much more slow and reflective. So if you're planning a trip overseas and that makes a big, big difference to what interventions um, you would bring to bear. And also it's important to think that during the day, we make something like psychologists' best guesses, we make something like 35,000 decisions um, in a day. So things like ignoring a smartphone uh, notification, taking a sip of coffee, not taking a sip of coffee, moving your hands, not moving your hands. There's lots of things we do. So when we're getting people to do things, uh, particularly um, around recycling and things like that, or uh, littering, where they're making quick decisions, we need to grab people's attentions and we're competing against a lot of other decisions during a day. So one of the really important things that we need to bear um, in mind is the kind of mental shortcuts that people uh, make. So people strive in general to make rational choices, but we are subject to what are called cognitive limitations. And we use mental shortcuts that lead to cognitive biases. And in essence, those are things that help shorten our decision making time. So we couldn't get through the day without those cognitive biases. They help us uh, go from one course of action to um, the next. Um, but the problem is that they lead to unconscious errors or mistakes. Um, and that's something we do on a daily basis. And it's really important when it comes to things like uh, recycling and littering and waste that we're aware of those and know how to counter those. So there's lots of biases out there. So uh, confirmation bias is, um, um, is a uh, popular one. Um, so that's the, uh, the bias that we place more value on information that supports our existing beliefs. Um, so um, how that translates is people on the internet, for example, tend to look for content that reinforces their worldview. Another one, distortion bias. Um, that one is, um, there's an example of a really interesting study that was done in the States, I think Boston University. Um, and to, to explain that further, um, what they found with their, um, with their study was that committed uh, recyclers, what they'll do is, I think it was in a university with their staff, um, when it came to uh, recycling cans, uh, cans that weren't damaged or dented, they'd uh, recycle, but if they were damaged or dented or crushed in any way, they'd throw in the bin rather than recycling them. And that was uh, the same was true with paper. Um, so that whole pieces of paper that recycle, but with paper that was cut up, they uh, wouldn't recycle. So that made a big difference uh, to whether uh, people uh, perceived items as having a use or no longer having a use and whether they would recycle it. So uh, they concluded that making people aware of this bias would make a big difference to their behaviour. And also doing things like changing packaging um, would also make a huge difference to what people did. Another one that Starbucks use really well, for example, is identity bias. So um, writing someone's name and a cup of coffee makes a big, big difference as to whether they'll throw it away or recycle it or not, because it gives you ownership um, of that, coin, that, that item of rubbish. So there's lots of different things that you can do um, and lots of biases that you need to be aware of. So how do you shift people's behaviours? Uh, so there's lots of frameworks out there. The ones I use the most and would encourage you to look, uh, look up is the, there's the East framework, 
which was developed by the Behavioural Insights team. And there's four simple principles. I'll come back to that in a second. And that's really helpful to think about how can we uh, start to nudge people in the right direction. I also use my own framework, the best framework, which helps take people through uh, particularly campaigns and other interventions. So if there's one thing I'd like you to come away with from today when it comes to tackling waste and recycling, it's really to think about what are the behaviours, what are people doing, what do we want them to do differently, and just have that, that time for reflection to think, what, what is it that we actually want to shift? And here's a, I'll share this after the session, but this is a really useful uh, model. This is something you can use um, in your teams, in focus groups, have sessions to really go through and unpick what is it you want to change? What are people doing? What do you want them to do? Who is doing it? All that kind of thing. And also considering things like, uh, like timing. So when is it that people recycle? Is it the, um, is it the night before bin day? Um, also thinking about you know, what people do when they move house, all those kinds of things. And just thinking, when is it that they're conducting the behavior? When do they uh, throw stuff away? And when is it that we want to um, change their behaviors? So if they're near the fridge, um, if they're somewhere else, um, what plays um, into that? So what I suppose a good example of that is uh, one of the things that when I do this exercise is I often find that people in flats want to recycle, but they don't have enough space to recycle. So just telling them to recycle isn't going to be enough. Um, giving them the information and saying this is what you need to do, that's not enough for them to change their behaviour. Um, you've got to... Uh, uh, basically, you've got to get them, uh, give them enough room or help them with kind of ease, convenience, that kind of thing. Um, so just a little bit about measurement. So those kind of barriers, um, another way to think about those barriers and how to tackle them, as you would expect, surveys and focus groups are all really useful as well, but also door knocking. It's a good example of asking people on the door, uh, can you recycle me, can you not? and going through a list of items um, so you get a really good understanding of what things people can and can't recycle and I'd always suggest uh, starting with that kind of knowledge gap so starting with quick wins like is it just a case of people don't know what to recycle I'm sure many of you on the call will know that even with committed recyclers sometimes they don't always know what the right thing to do is with their waste. So this is the model I was uh, talking about um, earlier, the East model. It's a four part model. Um, and to bring it back to what I was saying earlier, it brings predictability to what can often seem unpredictable human behaviour. So it's a four part model um, and it gives you some interventions that you can be confident you can apply and make a difference to uh, your uh, waste and recycling communications. So the first one is all about making it easy. So people like things that are easy. They like convenience. So how can you make it easier for people, attractive? So going back to what I was saying about uh, decisions and how many, people deci how many decisions people make in a day, what can we do to get people's attention and really disrupt um, the, their behaviour so they do what they, uh, you want them to do and you turn it into a uh, habit? Social is all about what other people around us do um, and how we can tap into that. And then timing is thinking about when do people, uh, when do they litter, when do they recycle, when do they get rid of their rubbish, and what do they see, what are the triggers around them that you can, um, that you can use to change their behaviour. Okay, so here's a good example of that in practice. Um, so this is something you can do around uh, food waste. So it's all about the right time in the right place. So thinking about people are often going to make decisions around um, uh, food waste by or near the fridge. So putting messages around the fridge, asking people to trust their senses. So does something look out of date is a good way um, to get across whether to know it, throw it away or not. Works for a lot of things, obviously wouldn't work for something like chicken. Doing things like having an eat soon shelf. So it's based on people's behaviour and what you want people to do differently. Uh, so this is something, a campaign I've been running um, in uh, Wandsworth, 
Um, and this is all around fly tipping. Uh, this is about increasing the perception that fly tippers will get caught. So the central element of this campaign has been um, about um, a kind of, uh, I suppose, a social norm message. So using that kind of someone in your area has just been fined £400. So using it on signs, using it on letters, on social media, on a CCTV witness appeal and really kind of personalising the message, highlighting what your neighbours are doing, making people think that it could happen to you. So if you bring all that to bear, it makes a big, big uh, difference. And we're also excited to be uh, using one of uh, Tiernan's AI chatbots um, in the near future, but I'll let Tiernan uh, talk about that. And that kind of brings all the behavioural science to bear because I'm sure that a lot of you will be aware that um, if you tend to if you just put up a sign saying no fly tipping what tends to happen is people actually fly tip there rather than um, do what you want them to do. Uh, so here's some examples here's um, um, some evaluation for the campaign so this is I think we tested it in a street in uh, Tootin and uh, before the uh, intervention we'd have um, regularly five to ten items dumped uh, by this lamp post, um, and then um, after we uh, did all the signs and letters and all that kind of stuff, we ended up with uh, something like I think there was a six-day period with zero fly tips, and I think we saved something like worked out about uh, sixteen thousand a year in terms of um, money spent on uh, fly tip removal. Uh, so here's another example of a good example of using social norm messaging. So asking uh, bin crews to put stickers on wheelie bins where households haven't put their first ways out um, with a message about what their neighbours are doing. So that's another really good example of how you can tap into that, what other people around you are doing and think about when is it that people, when, when's the trigger, when do you um, need to nudge people? Uh, so networks are also really important and thinking about who is recycling, particularly in the family. So kids can often be keen recyclers. So bringing all the theory together, um, um, asking them to put tags on um, in items that need to be cleaned and then recycled so that it reminds everyone in the household uh, to recycle that item is a good way of doing that. Um, and then having a, a weekly prize draw is a good way of reinforcing that behaviour so people are more likely to do it. And it's also gradual because it's one item a week. And a lot of... Um, behaviour change around recycling um, is, um, is about building up habits. So it's really important to um, think about how do you help people um, build up habits? And here's a kind of uh, a six step, step model for forming um, habits. So number one is thinking about that kind of uh, cue. So what is it um, uh, that helps people uh, start a habit or do something differently, uh, thinking about the environments, people being near the fridge, making it easy for them. Uh, people need to repeat a habit. So it takes something like 66 days to embed a habit or a new behavior. So if you're getting someone to recycle, you've got to repeat that message over and over again um, and just really think about how you build uh, that in. So having things like prize draws and turning it into an automatic behavior is uh, really important. Uh, so that's a quick whistle stop tour of uh, behavioural interventions that you can bring to pair. Uh, so I work with a number of local authorities um, and always happy to work with more. So if you'd be interested in uh, running behavioural interventions uh, in um, where you work in a public sector or other organisations, um, and I'll also share um, up and coming masterclasses that I'm organising. So I am going to stop sharing now. And I'm going to hand over to, uh, I think, John Paul next uh, to talk about all things uh, programmatic. Thank you very much, Don. I'm just going to get into the right screen so I can then share properly. Um, let's just quickly pull this back. So, yes, uh, thank you very much for that, Don. Um, I've worked with Don on a few things and he is brilliant where you have someone who's in charge of a service or holds budget, um, you know, holds the purse strings that um, doesn't really get um, the theory behind behaviour change. Bring him in and he can really help uh, make life easier for you. Um, today I'm going to talk about once you've designed 
the intervention once you've got the data done the research and design how you want to work um how do you then get that to everybody um and can we do media buying we mainly do programmatic media buying and i'll explain why we do that first um but then to zoom into a little bit the fundamentals of when you're planning interventions or communications campaigns that deliver behavior change what do you need to be thinking about um then some of the really um, large challenges that we all face and some tips on how to overcome them and then this idea potentially of building investable machines which may make sense shortly so why programmatic first programmatic is your way of putting messages across people's online behavior search youtube instagram ways guardian news everything it, the way we consume media has changed massively as i'm sure you'll be aware programmatic lets you build programs to put whatever intervention you want in front of people um now it's a huge sphere but in essence there is this huge data infrastructure out there that you can weave programs around to identify certain cues to place your intervention perfectly the function of that being that you can place your intervention at the right place in the right time rather than spending lots of money um, being in front of everyone all the time when they're maybe not in the right frame of mind so we can build programs like this for example we want to target foodies and we want to find people online searching for recipes looking at recipes um, to then put something alongside that recipe that nudges them into the hello lamppost food recycling chatbot or um, a, a, a simple ad that explains what food can go in and you know, that bones can or can't go in and so on. Um, <clears throat> that's going out and using third party data and you can build that so that sits there all the time, speaking to all the foodies in your location, making sure that they're clear on what to do when they finish cooking um, with, uh, with their food waste. Um, you can also build um, campaigns that anticipate cues from your own website. So for example, someone moves to your local area, sets up a new council tax um, account. You can then remarket to them multiple times in the coming months with, for example, a game that might help them get to grips with local recycling policy. The advantage of this approach versus um, say running a big poster campaign or buying TV or radio or something like that is that you're only going to spend money when people hit certain criteria, which means that your chances of hitting someone at the right place at the right time are much increased. Hence, programs, programmatic buying um, is, is, is something that we should be thinking about weaving into any campaign that we do. Um, so what do we actually need when before we go to any sort of media decisions? What are we looking after? What are we looking for? So we want to get to a significant proportion, 80, 90 percent of any target audience. Um, but not just once, it's not like delivering an email. We want to, them to see a message multiple times in scrolls and feeds, pre-roll videos over time so they become familiar with the message and then are more likely to engage with it. I've heard 70 times um, as being the amount of time someone needs to see a message. I've also heard seven, It's probably somewhere in the middle, probably near a seven, but um, putting the right message at the right time for, consistently in front of people. So you need reach and you need frequency. frequency um, and then you also need to eradicate waste using time. So that, that, that timely bit of the East framework is really what the, you know, the, the media buying function is trying to do. What are the challenges, the barriers that we often come up against? So it's the opposite of what we were just saying. We're, um, we, we, we struggle, we can put something on a bus stop, but is that person really about to do some food waste recycling? Um, also, you know, it's, it's a challenge to find, if it's not at the bus stop, then when is the right time to get somebody? And then also, when we do, if we do have the right place and the right time, what's the right information or prod or nudge that we can put in front of that person? How do we phrase that? How do we make it something that their brains can process really easily and something that makes them feel like they're part of a bigger group, something that makes the action really, really clear. So right message, right place, right time. This is a huge challenge and, and, and something that wonderfully digital media um, helps us start to tackle. And it's quite a cluttered slide, I apologize, but here are some tips. So 
before you start communicating, understand, you know, using that sort of expertise that Don is talking about, you know, what is the behavior that you want people to take? What's the user experience they're probably going to go for? So looking at recipe to something like this. Um, so decide that before you then start looking at channels. Sometimes we can default get right, bang that across on organic social. And then you look a few weeks later and you've got six likes. It's like, oh, don't, don't know that. You, you need to think about where are these people going to be where that intervention will make sense. Really start using your own website as um, a source of first party audience data. So people that have been looking at school term dates, let's assume that they're family decision makers. They might be high creators of waste. What message do we want to appear in their Facebook? feeds and their news feeds after they've been in check school term dates. Um, same thing goes for council tax. There might be um, people accessing certain sorts of benefits that indicate that they're in certain conditions that we can give them alternatives and, and, and other ways of doing things. Um, that idea of recipes, but also ideas of when people are online looking at certain things that are usually a precursor to um, creating waste of some sort. So it could be shopping for things, planning shops, or it could be looking at recipes on YouTube, um, BBC Good Food. Again, the wonderful thing about programmatic is you can have your prompts across those sites for fractions of a penny. Um, also think about the other things that your organization might be doing. Pretty much everything that a council does will have some link to the local economy, to reducing carbon or protecting the environment, or to health. Now, there are various campaigns that will be running like shop local, support local businesses um, that probably have an environmental benefit. So consider reaching out to the people that are controlling things. Like, is there a win-win here for us? Could we have a shop local, maybe shop um, in, in those zero waste shops, um, promote these sorts of things together so that when our campaigns align, we both get a win from that. Same with health, you know, uh, looking to improve your health in the coming months, maybe um, buying fruit and veg and cooking at home a little bit more versus takeaways, all these things could be positive. Um, also shopping local means using less Amazon, which could have an impact on less uh, on, on waste reduction as well. So there are lots of little things that maybe you could, you could align with that mean you've got much more chance of having always on prompts and prods in front of residents, just giving them opportunities and nudging them in the, in the right direction. These sorts of approaches and these sort of campaigns, if you imagine a program that's just sort of always on, it starts to become a kind of behavior change um, machine so that you can get to a point where if you're measuring the outcomes, tonnage collected, tonnage to, to landfill, um, reduced tonnage overall, increased tonnage in recycling, you can start to get to link the cost per um, uh, communications intervention with outcomes. And then um, you develop essentially an investable behavior change machine so that when a director of service comes to you and says we've got this target but i'm sorry i've only got two grand you can say well we know roughly that the um you know the, the cost per outcome is it so for two grand we'll anticipate you'll get this if you actually want to achieve your target you're probably going to need to look at a larger number now not every council will have that number initially and i think the behavior change network will be a really good place for us to share benchmarking around these kinds of campaigns and I'm more than happy to share anything that we've worked on in, in, in the past but getting out of that conversation I've got two grand what can you do to actually generally the industry average for a you know a ton reduction in waste to landfill is about this um, so if you want to achieve a 20 ton reduction you're going to need a marketing budget of this it just takes it off um, you know, the comms magic, you know, pull the rabbit out the hat type thing and into the realms of this is demonstrable and based on data. And then we can also start to get people to think more long term. We have an ambition as a as a location, as an authority to reduce to carbon zero or net negative um, in this time frame. So, yes, there's this campaign this year, but also we, we're going to start to build machines that drive and nudge people into better behaviors so that we can achieve x by x time so that's a really quick whiz through those elements um just to be clear one thing I, we're thinking about here is how to make the campaigns that we run net zero so hosting a youtube ad um actually generates a little bit of carbon um printing things obviously generates carbon so we're hosting a session um uh, sort of um looked at funded by the forestry commission 
where we'll talk about how to think about the impact of campaigns, the carbon impact or carbon released by campaigns, how to mitigate that as much as possible, and then what you can't mitigate, how to plant trees locally with the Forestry Commission to ensure that all campaigns are net negative. I think it's important that we think about that as we want everyone else to. And I can also imagine those sorts of questions, you know, how much carbon was released by, uh, by you printing this leaflet and so on. And so having the answer in place is really good. And that's going to be on February the 10th. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to come to that, just drop me a line, um, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll send you an invite. Um, so uh, that's everything from me. Do you want to do questions now or at the end? Keep going, and then we'll do uh, questions at the end if that's okay. Uh, that was uh, really helpful, and uh, I will. Uh, I was going to make a few comments, but I'll I'll hold. Right, we'll go to Tiana next. Great stuff. Uh, just let me know if you can see these. Yeah, no, it's all good. Yeah. Cool. Oh, skipped one. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll I'll just talk a little bit about uh, for for the benefit of those who who aren't aware of Header Lab Post, what uh, we do uh, as a company as a platform. Um, a little bit about kind of what that means for organisations that we work with, but also. Um, residents, you know, uh, tourists, the general public, um, and then a little bit about kind of where we're deployed and why, and, and I'll touch on um, some of the work that um, that's coming up that Dominic mentioned around uh, fly tipping. Um, but just briefly, uh, what Header Lamppost is, so we're, we're a software-based company that essentially makes any place or space interactive. Um, what that means is we, we use objects and, and pieces of infrastructure and locations within public realms uh, within physical environments and, and make them interactive. So, you know, we're not um, we're not installing new objects uh, and we're not uh, adding any hardware to existing objects. Um, all we do, and this is a, a really basic example on this picture, but all we do is add a QR code or instruction uh, to any object. So that can be anything from a, a planter, like on, on this slide, all the way through to a, a, a bin, a bus stop, a statue, a building, uh, a bridge, whatever that may be. And that has a variety of different reasons why we do that. And, and I'll run through, through that in a sec. Um, but really our, our purpose is giving people on the street easier access to local information, whilst also helping uh, organizations uh, who have uh, an interest in engaging with those audiences, um, enable them to gather widespread behavior, feedback, sentiment, and then over time actually encourage different behaviors um, and improve areas. So we work in everywhere from, from streets and high streets and town centers to museums, to uh, shopping malls, to, to, to university campuses. Um, how it works, so as you probably saw on the last slide, uh, essentially uh, any object that has a, a QR code activated by, by us um, can interact. And that interaction looks like a, a two-way humanistic conversational uh, interaction uh, over things like SMS, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. Um, so for the user, you know, they don't even have to have a, have a smartphone, they can do it over SMS uh, or choose a different platform should they wish to do so. Um, and, you know, th that object in the platform does many clever things like recognizes if it's spoken to that person before and becomes more familiar. Um, it can kind of answer people's questions, uh, but it can also kind of educate them on the relevance of that object, that area, that campaign, whatever whatever the context is for that deployment. Um, and this is a little example. So the, the, the um, shot on the left is, is a lamppost in, in Media City in Salford. Um, and for them, it's all about kind of gathering, you know, visitor user feedback around about the area to better inform how they shape that area, whilst also letting them know about what amenities are available in that area, um, if any events are happening, um, things like that. So this gives you kind of a feel of, of the flow of, of those kind of AI driven conversations. And as you can see here, you know, thanks for waking me up. So this is kind of a, an introduction to not having met someone before and it will usually reference kind of if it's a nice day and, and things like that. Um, and this one's referencing that, you know, here's chat to you about the area and hear your thoughts. And what that means for the organizations that we work with. So like I mentioned before, we work with uh, many, many councils, but also um, property developers, uh, museums, cultural and heritage organizations, university campuses, et cetera. 
Um, and the kind of the, the, the behind the scenes element to Hello Lamppost is kind of the distillation, the aggregation and the analytics. Um, so all responses that are continuously coming in because it's a, a two way interaction, objects are continuously asking people questions. Um, and that is shaped through us based on you know, a council's priorities around, you know, a deployment, an area, a project, a campaign, whatever that may be. Um, and then our system is constantly doing those analytics around people's sentiment and, and providing that data back uh, in, a, you know, in a format that's that's most useful and, at, you know, at the click of a button as much as possible. Um, so in terms of what we do and, and where we do it, um, so we, we've deployed in, I guess, almost 50 different locations around the world for a number of different reasons. Um, and here's just a, a kind of a couple of examples. So we work uh, in a number of different areas around the Sydney Harbour. Um, and for them, it's it's for the organization we work with, which is the, the Harbour Trust, um, is, is really about bettering visitor experience, you know, continuously tracking mass visitor feedback and sentiment so that they're constantly informed on how to improve the area, um, but actually also weaving in consultations. These are really large, um, culturally significant areas. Um, so as you can imagine, consultation is, is super important. Um, and actually for them, you know, they, they did a traditional consultation or they do traditional consultations, but then they also use Hello Lamppost as an additional channel for that. Um, and actually we, you know, one consultation uh, last year that we were involved in um, increased kind of um, engagement with harder to reach, more diverse audiences by about 150% compared to what they'd done previously. Um, but also the actual overall reach uh, uh, in terms of um, engagement within consultations as well. Um, and a lot of those have now fed through into actually design and going into construction uh, soon. So it's, it's kind of a great example of data through Hello Lamppost being actually um, helping drive um, the future of, of certain areas. Um, and also uh, there's elements of behavior change. So um, using those, those, those locations, those interactions and those objects to uh, either encourage people to go uh, and visit elsewhere or be more, more conscious about um, littering in, in those areas, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's different elements of behavior change. Um, another, uh, government organization we're working with is Royal Borough of Winter and Maidenhead. So um, again, very common for us to, to be used in kind of multiple different use cases at once in parallel. So as you can imagine, various different um, cultural and historical assets and points of interest, which can come to life or do, are coming to life and, and um, giving people the history of that object and, and the area, whilst also gathering their kind of uh, visitor sentiment and, and feedback, but also various different operational efficiencies and, and behavior change around, you know, activating parking meters to um, make it easier for people to answer their queries rather than, you know, having to um, uh, call up or email uh, the council and take up their time. Um, and also around, you know, bus stops. So um, people can ask bus stops, you know, when's the next bus route number 12 or, or whatever that may be. Um, so there's operational efficiencies around that as well. Um, and then we're also working in Maidenhead, uh, again, which is partly behaviour change. So we're actually ac activating um, all of the hoarding at all, I think it's 12 or 15 um, construction sites. So the hoarding will be activated, people will interact, and, and that's partly about educating them on what's, what's happening there, uh, but also changing their behaviour from uh, a place where they don't necessarily know what's going on there and they have negative reactions um, so actually by, by educating and, and asking them their opinions, we're, we're changing the behavior from a, from a negative one to, to a positive one for their area. Slightly different one is working with uh, a university campus in, in Canada. Um, and for them, as you can imagine, it is making students on campus better informed um, about various different topics, whether it be parking all the way through to sustainability and recycling on campus, uh, all the way through to really different ones. They've got a number of air qualities across, uh, air quality sensors across campus that we have activated, which you can kind of see in this, in this picture. Um, but we've actually activated for people to talk to those. And, and again, it's about educating them about air quality across campus, but also shifting their behavior about what consequence their behaviors are having on air quality across campus and therefore the health of the effects for people visiting campus. Um, and that's tied into transport to campus and how they can alter people's uh, behaviors um, and habits around traveling to campus. 
Um, and then we've also worked with Staffordshire, uh, and I think I spotted someone um, mentioning uh, mentioning this, but we worked on a number of different campaigns. So it doesn't have to be um, ongoing permanent um, projects or installations that we work on. It can actually be uh, on campaigns such as you know, sustainability. Um, we've worked, worked on consultations around um, climate crisis action um, to see you know, what people's uh, reflections and sentiments and, and thoughts are around it. Um, and then also to educate on what the councils are doing, but also to, to, to change behaviours. Um, and then one last one I'll, I'll just touch on is, is what Dominic mentioned is, um, I don't have a slide for it, apologies, but um, is our work just around uh, fly tipping. So um, we'll be activating the hotspots uh, within within the borough um, and it will be actively kind of encouraging people who are, are passing by or, 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 um, or at those locations um, to A, be able to report fly tipping, but also to report fly tippers. Uh, and that behavior changes revolved around, well, uh, you know, if people um, see that uh, they, they may be reported, um, then it might encourage them not to do it. Um, but also it's an automated way when people are there uh, to actually ping through, through a really simple interaction. Um, and again, that's kind of the flexibility of the platform. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, super friendly and conversational. It can be quite transactional in terms of how people interact. It's just lowering the barriers to entry for people to do that. So that's a, a whistle stop tour. Uh, yeah, hopefully people have some questions, but I'll um, I'll leave some time for Phil to speak as well. That's great. Thanks very much, Tina. Um, I think I'm going to quickly hand over to you, uh, Phil. And yeah, there's there's a number of questions in the chat, Tina. So do have a look, and the, and then we'll come back to those after Phil and go through um, all the questions that people ask. So keep them coming. So over to you, Phil. Phil, just to see your screen okay. Screen okay, unmuted. Excellent, right, we can uh, make start. So thanks for joining today's webinar, everyone. Hopefully you've enjoyed it so far. Uh, so in my session, I'm gonna have a look at some ways in which we're able to transform recycling communications to ultimately reduce contamination. Uh, Recollect as a brand works with over 400 local authorities across North America and the UK. Um, so hopefully we can share some of our findings from the discussions we've had and demonstrate a couple of ways in which we might be able to help. So it'd be great if, you know, 100% of people recycle correctly, 100% of the time, but we know that's not quite the case. And it's for a variety of reasons, but commonly because it's confusing. And that's confusing for residents who are quite keen recyclers, they're trying to do the best. It can be confusing for people where recycling is more of an afterthought. And again, it's for a variety of reasons, really. So rules change, packaging changes, people change location. And all of a sudden, you know, they've got an item they used to recycle that they now can't, which can lead to confusion. And if they have any questions about that, they want immediate answers. They want to find out this information straight away, because sometimes it's a spur of the moment decision if there's, you know, uncertainty. And that uncertainty is where people make um, assumptions. And that's where they guess. Um, and ultimately, that kind of ties down to a lack of knowledge about the recycling system. You know, they don't have an idea of the impact of recycling incorrectly. Um, and it's also about education as well. So it's, um, you know, one of the interesting things that we've found, is, excuse me, uh, one of the interesting things we found is that some of the most committed recyclers are actually the ones who contaminate and they're not really updating their education. Um, they, you know, kind of sometimes think that they're doing an okay job and not really realizing that anything is changing. Um, so in terms of communication, it's a challenge for residents, but it's a challenge for local authorities as well, um, because they're, you know, having to get this recycling message out to people. Um, and a lot of it's through printed material, which is quite a costly, time-consuming way of doing things. Um, we're trying to reach out to people through in-person events, such as workshops and seminars, but that's a small audience. We really want to target a whole population of people. Um, and in particular, these next few points are quite good regards um, behaviour change. So people are unaware of the mistakes that they're making sometimes. Um, they'll you know, recycle, they'll put the bin out, and if it's collected every time without issue, they don't realise that there's you know, anything wrong. So it's key in terms of comms to make sure that we're educating these residents, we're encouraging the good behaviour, um, but we're really helping to build awareness and make sure that there's a driver <clears throat> for change. And again, it comes back to assumptions. So if they can't get correct and up-to-date information, that's where the guesswork happens. 
Um, and that really is, you know, it might be a case of they know an item is recyclable and this similar item, you know, I'll try and recycle that. The recycling service is going to sort it out for me because people don't want to put things to landfill most of the time, but they're not realizing the impact that, you know, kind of these wrong decisions have. And information is available, but it's a case of getting it in a way that residents can access it easily and it's likely to stick in their memory as well. And that's where digital comes in. So ultimately we're wanting to you know, get people onto digital. They already are in most cases, as we see from this slide, but it's a case of getting that recycling information onto the digital format as well. It allows us to reach a wider audience, it allows us to engage with them better. And while some residents will still need perhaps the old school approach of you know, leaflets and flyers, if we can get residents self-serving better, then that's good for them and we're able to reach more people as well. And that's ultimately where the new style of communication comes in and how you know we've been able to help with digital. So the thing is with lots of static websites and you know these leaflets is they become out of date, any service changes, and we then need to redo the whole process. And digital really allows us to target a direct uh, directly an audience with the message that they need at the right time, and we can then measure how effective that communication is. And we can encourage that behavior with uh, notifications, alerts, updates through smartphone apps, et cetera, which allow us to continue to encourage that good behavior that people are doing. And if they do change location with digital, they can immediately access all the information that they need and that they're looking for. So and ultimately it's making it more accessible and enabling the people who want to recycle to be able to do that better. And it's, you know, it's already here is digital. People are already using these tools, so why not look at expanding it as much as possible? Because ultimately it allows us to build trust with the residents, to change their behavior by encouraging what we would like them to do and being transparent with them. If the communication is improved between council, resident and recycling service, we're able to explain more of the why. You know, why of this item unrecyclable? What are we doing about it in future? And that's really where we're trying to transform the, you know, the information that residents have access to. And we've got some examples of, of how that's working today. So typically, if you have a look at some websites, it's kind of this big, long list of uh, what bin, you know, what item goes in this, what doesn't. And it's hard if residents have a specific query to get that information. Um, so we've developed a, a smart recycling search tool dependent on each council's um, kind of rules and restrictions but it allows residents to get answers to specific queries straight away at the point of their query. So it's location specific. A resident can type in a really specific item, Pringles, for example, and that will direct them to the correct listing. And what I wanna do is give them all the information we need about that item. So in this case, why it can't be recycled, alternative recycling schemes to try and prevent it from going to landfill and any collection information we want to share with them. And the residents are able to go back, search each item. It's very easy to do, which again is the key. So batteries, a common contamination item. We're able to explain to the resident a bit about why. Why does it need to be separate? As you can see there. And then again, we're offering additional options to try and direct them, you know, into the most appropriate place. So this would be recycled in a separate bag, but we're giving them, you know, they could take them to a supermarket. They can take them to recycling centers and directions are included as well for them to do that. So it's all the information they need at that point, and then they can go and make that best decision. So beneficial for residents, but ultimately the council can, because it's digital, can get the data and analytics from these searches. So you start building out a picture of what people are searching for, where the confusion is, and what are the problem items before they become problems. We see here from this example data that, you know, we've got some of the most commonly searched items. This is what residents are looking for, so communications can be targeted around these items in future. You can then look at how effective communications are. So with a reduction in searches over time, hopefully that means that communication campaigns are resonating with residents and their behavior is actually changing. And you can then even go down into how residents are accessing information, the languages that future communications might be in. And ultimately this helps with more traditional methods. So you can start looking at what leaflets would need to be produced rather than en masse, can specifically target certain areas and certain products. So the search tool is kind of for residents who uh, know they have a problem, but how do we help residents who don't know they have a problem? Well, one of these tools is this uh, interactive waste sorting game. So 
but challenges residents to put their recycling knowledge to the test with the intuitive drag and drop system. So, you know, which bin does it go into? Sounds simple, but as a resident gets something wrong, they're then able to try again, but the behavior is reinforced. But actually, something they've done wrong previously, they now can do correctly. With the gamification aspect, that tends to resonate longer and it's more likely to come back to mind. But again, because it's digital, we get the analytics data from the gameplays. Again, more sample data, we see that for this council, for example, one in two residents is incorrectly recycling coffee pods when they don't go in the recycling bin. You've got a variety of options, but we could develop a really specific campaign around this item and exactly how it's going wrong without having to look at the waste stream. So it's tackling the issue before it becomes a problem. And ultimately with digital, we find that residents are able to engage repeatedly. So perhaps instead of a, a leaflet that comes through the door and goes to the back of the cupboard, residents will be able to come back repeatedly. And as long as the information is accurate, up to date and relevant, they can keep returning whenever they need information. And that helps, again, the frequency of that is able to adjust the behavior. And we do see that these digital tools have impact in reducing contamination. Residents no longer need to ring up ask queries that can self-serve. And if they're getting quicker answers, then they're much more likely to remember those as well. And we can support, you know, the reduction of printing costs. So some residents will stay in league literature, but we're able to optimize that, make it specific. And ultimately, the more they self-serve, the more likely they are to be able to recycle better. So very much a whistle stop tour, but uh, if anyone has any questions in the Q&A or after, feel free to follow up and we'd be delighted to speak to you. Great. Thanks so much. That was uh, fascinating. Thank you to all of our uh, speakers. If I could ask, uh, yeah, brilliant. You've all turned your cameras and uh, mics on. So yeah, I'm quickly going to try and go through all the uh, questions. I think Jay, John Paul has answered a few of them already. So I'm going to go straight to, I think this was for Tiernan, which was, um, does this cater to different languages spoken and how does it stop people from just walking by if they are busy? Is there an incentive to start? Uh, just on the language piece uh yeah so the platform supports 90 plus languages um we've done everything from uh, i think welsh came up on on the on the chat but welsh to uh french to uh yeah a variety but yeah 90 plus languages um, and we can display that on the sign or not but the system automatically kind of recognizes what they're saying hello or starting the interaction with um what stops the person um number of different things but we'll usually kind of alter according to the deployment, the, the, the purpose, the project. Um, and yes, we can include kind of incentives um, and we'll work with, you know, the councils or whoever the organization we're working with to, to build that in and build that into the, the signage. Um, the, the base is, is, is intrigue or purpose. So if they're reporting fly tipping, there's obviously you know, an anonymous um, incentive to do that. Um, and if it's, you know, uh, a statue that says, you know, I'm a talking statue, then there's the kind of in intrigue factor to it. Also, I was going to say, just doing things like, uh, I mean, lots of the kind of stuff around lettering um, has very bright colours, so it attracts people's attention and just simple things like making sure you put it at eye height can make a uh, big difference. Um, and I think there was a question about who gives permission for the signs? Um, is it the council? Is it somewhere else on that post? Is planning permission needed? Sure. Uh, we haven't come across any deployments in the planning commission. Um, it's not advertising. They're you know they're operational signs. Um, we usually work with the councils uh, directly on that, um, and we usually work with either their uh, approved suppliers on on signage and installation. Um, but we've never had an issue with with gaining permissions. Um, we won't go and seek it. We'll work with the council to to provide the right information so that that we can collectively get that permission yeah and i think working with you it's either it's generally either the council or tfl that you need permission uh from so i think those are the questions for turning uh oh there's a comment about waste wizard tool being uh brilliant so what is the difference this one is for uh phil so what uh is there is there any difference between waste wizard and recyclenow.com um, I think one of the key benefits that we found is mainly the analytics. So again, it's powering, you know, you've got the insight from what people are searching for in detail and you can see how, and that ultimately is where, you know, you're going to build future campaigns from. And that level of detail is not just helping the resident, but 
you know, giving you extra resource in terms of you know, really specifically targeting where you want people to change their behavior. Uh, and then uh, moving on to the next question, what is the cost benefit of using Waste Wizard? Is there a proven reduction in contamination and clear savings? So uh, again, for you, Phil. Yeah, good question. It's often tied into you know, other schemes which are, which are running. Um, we have found that with customers who are using it, it becomes the number one route that residents would go to. So rather than emailing or ringing up or you know, recycling incorrectly, all of that can be addressed. So it delivers savings on a, on a couple of fronts. We'd be happy to uh, put you in touch with a current you know, UK council who are using the tool to explain further. Don, can I, uh, there's a question up about <clears throat> targeting people who aren't online. And I think it's a really strong one. You've got these sort of street furniture routes to reaching people. There are the old things, leaflets. Um, there's also you know, about 95% of people according to Ofcom, have access, regular access to the internet. Most of it's through smartphones. We found, for example, running vaccine comms, that getting people in households, you can reach pretty much every household online and then facilitate people to have conversations with people who aren't online uh, in that way. Often as well, people who are you know, really not online, we're talking often about much, much older audiences, people who are probably in contact with some sort of council service and maybe waste and recycling is often done for them as well. The point isn't so much to get everyone, um, you know, to, to, to exclude anyone or to be 100% digital. It's just about planning as many routes and as many ways of giving people opportunities to do the right thing and nudging them to do that. So online has to be a part of it, but that's not to say that offline lampposts, benches, all sorts of things are great ways to engage people. Um, but, but, but yes, the, the also as well, remember when you're looking at running campaigns and marketing, the outcome is going to be reduced tonnage, not so much 100% reach. Um, so a pretty complicated response to that question, but but there's lots of things that you can do. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, there was a question, um, I think, following my slides around uh, putting uh, images, CCTV footage on uh, posters. And the question was, are there any uh, legal implications? And I think um, the legal legal advice does change from uh, council to council. But I think generally, um, generally, the advice has been, I found that um, as long as you don't keep uh, either videos or posters up for too long, uh, then you're okay. So we wouldn't um, have put the images in a council magazine, but what we did do is put them on a poster, but didn't uh, keep them up for too long. Um, and then there was another question about in your campaign, was the fly tipping taken to the tip or similar displaced? And I think that was interesting. I think when, as we progressed the campaign, we found that different things happened and that we had to change our interventions. So a lot of the time we would uh, we would do something and if it didn't match up to the right behaviour, it wasn't necessarily successful. So some of the times, if it was a case of ease or convenience, uh, then we had to make sure there was another option. And why was it that people were putting the rubbish in that place? So sometimes if we tried to find people that actually it was because they had no other option, that didn't work. But if it was a case of uh, looking at other options, like if they were dumping a lot of stuff like sofas or mattresses, um, whether or not we could use freegals. So, I mean, there were lots of different things we tried and lots of interventions. So it was always coming back to basics about what is the behaviour um, and then um, basically thinking about how we um, could match that to um, uh, to the right behaviour. But yeah, sometimes it was displaced. We just had to uh, pivot a bit. Um, I was just going to say, if I could ask the uh, rest of the speakers, is there any other questions uh, that you want to pick up in the uh, chat? Because we I just saw Georgia. Yeah. I see Georgia seems to be sort of pulling her hair out at a wit's end about um, certain locations where people just don't care. I think it's important to understand the limits of technology and communications. Um, much like with anti-vaxxers or people who just won't engage with services, you can't be realistically expected to get people that never engage and hate the council and will never do anything to, to shift. Much more of what we're, is, is reasonable to expect is to get people who are pretty much always, almost there and nudge them a little bit further. That's where most of your positive outcomes will come from. Um, in, in, in terms of um, coercion into behaving when they've got everything there, 
I, I totally feel I understand, but maybe the, the, the task and the objective to fix that from your point of view is, is unreasonable. Um, whilst I can hear what you're saying, whereas the, the majority of the population is probably far more successful on that front. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. I was just going to add add uh, a quick point. I've spotted a, uh, I've been copy and pasting a few questions that um, we haven't got around to. I was just going to um, post my email address in the chat if anyone uh, wants to pick up and we haven't covered the questions. One quick one that I know Shannon Shannon's rewritten. Um, that's a quick one. No, there are no additional charges for users to to SMS the platform. Okay, great. I think we've covered uh, all the questions. Um, is there any that we've missed at all, John Paul? Do you know? There are a few. I've tried to respond directly to some people, but I think if we do follow up and uh, Dominic, if you CC the three of us in and if someone hasn't done something, just respond to us and um, we can go from there. And thanks to everyone who's agreed to share things as well. I'll get that those elements to you as well, Dom. And, um, you can send out what will be a monster email to everyone yeah, that's that, registered. That's great. And I'm sure um, everyone will be happy to um, share their contact details and um, answer any more questions. I'll send those around uh, for everyone. So uh, just to say uh, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you uh, very much for coming. Hope you uh, found it useful and we'll share the slides and we'll uh, share a recording and uh, hope to see you at uh, another event soon. Thank you.